Top Med Talk. Hello, I'm Desiree Chapel, and this is Top Med Talk. I'm here with Monty Mythen, editor in chief of Top Med Talk. So, Top Med Talk is in Orlando, Florida, this week for the SPACI 14th annual Perioperative Medicine Summit. Now, SPACI is the Society of Perioperative Assessment and Quality Improvement, and the Perioperative Medicine Summit is the society's annual international multidisciplinary meeting, and it's typically held about this time of year. So, we've had the opportunity to sit down with several of the board and directors for the meeting um, today already, but we now have the opportunity to sit down with a very special guest. I'm Dr. Amir Jaffer. Hello. Thank you, Desiree, Hello. and uh, thank you, Monty, for having me here this afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Dr. Jaffer is the Chief Medical Officer for the New York Presbyterian in Queens, and you also happen to be the Founding Director of the Perioperative Medicine Summit, so it all started with you, right? Yeah, it sure <laughs> did, uh, but there's an important person uh, who Monty might remember when uh, Monty came out to yeah. speak uh, in Cleveland, I believe, uh, was, uh, you know, my late friend, Franklin Mishoda, yes. uh, mm-hmm. who was not only a friend, but a mentor. And uh, he was actually uh, the head of the section of hospital medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. And he really inspired me to sort of work with him to really put this course together. So I have to say uh, the credit shouldn't be going just to me, but really uh, to Frank as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, Frank really was an inspiration uh, in my life and in the lives of a lot of other hospital medicine uh, physicians. Yeah, well, it's wonderful that he can live on through Absolutely. the summit, right? And there's a lecture tomorrow. There is. Yeah, there's in his Franklin name. Memo- uh, Franklin Mishoda Memorial Lecture. That's yeah, right. That's great. And it's Dumin- Duminda. That's good to be giving that tomorrow. That's right. Yeah. Great. Well, excited to hear about that. Well, thanks again for sitting down with us. It's always really important to top med talk that when we're at meetings, we can talk to the people that had a hand in developing um, the particular meeting. And the summit has been really unique. This is my first time here. Great. Um, Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. And I am a CRNA um, by training. (laughs) And so this has been great. I mean, this is, you know, right up. Our alley and anesthesia. Maybe when we're done, sure. we'll talk about how best to recruit CRNAs. That's right. <laughs> That's a challenge in the country. It, it is. It is. I know everybody, I've been hearing uh, someone was talking about in Florida how they just can't get any C- <laughs> CRNAs down. It's the weather. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But um, but it's been fantastic. I love that we sit down at 8 o'clock and the first thing you hear is this awesome update about, you know, what is happening in our world of, of perioperative medicine. That's, it was very powerful yeah. and great. I think that the update uh, really helps the uh, audience to really uh, hear about all the latest studies uh, in the area of perioperative medicine that probably will impact care. Yeah. So they like to uh, pick a lot of references that uh, will have an impact on care. Um, and uh, Steve, Barbara, and Paul uh, go back a long long time and uh, they're nice trio to be yeah they are they work really really well together it was really really good you can see the the dynamic you know um chemistry there right (laughs) that's good throughout the whole meeting i think what's really neat about it too is that it gets everybody pumped up and excited for what you're going to be learning because you get all this and then that translation of okay this is how you actually take it into practice and start using it exactly yeah and was that whenever you started the summit is that kind of what your your vision for my uh, vision and frank vision was, you know, how do we get everybody in this space together, right? The anesthesiologists, the internists, um, uh, the advanced practice providers, um, the CRNAs, um, everybody together um, and have them hear about the latest evidence, um, but make it very practical. So bring in speakers who have expertise Um, but also um, who are involved with uh, managing patients on Mm -hmm. a day-to-day basis. And um, that's that's how this um, symposium uh, or meeting got off the ground, is because we brought in the best speakers, but we also got in people who were very knowledgeable because they were either produced guidelines or research. Um, And and then, uh, you know, we had the cutting edge um, evidence base to Mm -hmm. share with the audience. 
Yeah, and, and everyone's so passionate about it, you Absolutely. know, <laughs> what they're talking about. I think about. we've really created a very, very unique community now, right, in perioperative yeah. medicine. Um, and that's what this meeting has really helped foster, in my opinion. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Monty, we were listening to um, uh, Amir's presentation today. And what kind of sh- stuck out to you or struck you as some of the things that were... Well, it's in your new role, as I understand, Amir is a chief medical officer. So responsible for the delivery of many of these things, but broader yeah. than that. There's a couple of things I just wanted to pick up on. Uh, one sure. of them was uh, respect. And I think I heard you right. You, in your institution, now have a chief respect officer. Oh, my gosh. What's, I wrote that down, too. What's, so, so what's, what's one of them? Yeah, so, <laughs> Where do you get them? You know, when I started at our organization about um, two years ago, um, I um, came into, uh, I don't know if you know much about New York Presbyterian, but New York Presbyterian came together about 15 years ago. New York Hospital and Presbyterian Hospital got together. We have two Ivy League medical schools, uh, Cornell, uh, Columbia. And so you, the, the organization, New York Presbyterian, was made up of two different cultures. And then over the last few years, they've acquired more hospitals, including the hospital that I'm at, which is now called New York Presbyterian Queens, but used to be called Booth Memorial and then New York Hospital Queens. And this is the new name. So when I landed um, here, um, you know, I started to learn more about all the transformation that was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, the really senior leadership, our CEO, Steve Corvin, um, our chief operating officer, Laura Fries, um, felt that we had a problem. Mm -hmm. We had a problem with respect in the organization. And um, so they really um, worked with the frontline employees to put together this respect credo. It was on one of my slides today. Yeah. And uh, the bottom line is that every role, every voice counts, right? That's the fundamental premise of the Respect Credo. But it's very, it's an amazing document if you get a chance um, to spend more time to read it. Um, That was the beginning of really our journey in um, the whole um, transformation in the culture, but starting with respect because... The leaders felt um, that if we don't have respect, we really can't do anything. You can't have teamwork um, if you don't have respect. um, And you really can do the things that you really need to do in healthcare because healthcare is really a team sport. And um, so we started there and then uh, we basically um, took it to the front lines and we talked every single day about respect. We took examples of uh, respect uh, that employees would come up and talk about uh, or disrespect mm-hmm. that they'd been disrespected by talking about it every single day. Then we had a major employee retreat at New York Presbyterian Queens a year later, which was also mm-hmm. fo- focused on respect. And now the enterprise, which is 40,000 employees, wow. um, uh, decided very recently over the last couple of months that they would have a chief respect officer. If you don't have respect, you basically can't do anything. Right? Yeah. So, what is the chief respect officer? What powers do they? How do they? Let's, yeah. let's imagine someone's acting up and just won't show respect. Yeah. It's deep in their DNA to be a <laughs> pain in the whatever. So it is. I, I'll just <laughs> tell you that uh, even before we appointed a chief respect officer at our organization, um, we were well underway on this journey, and so. When r- reports of disrespect got up to our leaders, they had the ability to actually remove and fire individuals. You said that during your presentation. Yep. I was amazed. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, wow. And, um, and it uh, works. I mean, it's... It, it's, it works. It yeah. works. It works. Yeah. That's so can, interesting. Can I have another one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> you went values, credo, and then huddles. Yeah. Tell us about your huddles. Mm, yeah. They're not cuddles, but the yeah. huddles. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So over the last um, year, we've been on a lean journey, but nobody knows that we practice lean. So what I mean by that is um, our leadership decided that a lot of people – get intimidated by a lot of these Japanese words around Gemba Mm -hmm. and and so forth, right? And they decided, well, what do we really want? We want leaders to be visible, transparent, 
out there with their employees, yeah. observing how things are going, giving them feedback, giving them coaching. But at the same time, we needed a structured approach to get um, information up to the leadership yeah. so we can break down silos, we can make sure resources are available, figure out where the challenges are, so we can get involved as leaders. But you need to um, build that relationship with your em employees to share information because oftentimes employees feel intimidated to stare, share information um, with their supervisors. So we, um, again, approximately a year ago, we started this journey uh, of putting into place uh, three tiers of huddles. Oh. The first tier uh, is the tier one huddle, which happens at the unit level. And at the unit level, you have clinicians, nurses, doctors coming together at the unit level. And they have a huddle board. Um, they have a structured approach. They just spend 10 or 15 minutes sort of huddling together. Um, and reviewing all sorts of information, perhaps information from overnight. Mm -hmm. um, but they have two huddles a day now on every unit. And uh, then from there, that information uh, is fed up to the directors, um, which we call their tier two huddles. Um, and then the directors bring that information to a leadership huddle mm -hmm. that occurs at 10 a.m. every day. Um, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, have um, we basically have a board um, and we basically have very structured information that we wow. go through uh, it's usually it's about 50 plus um, uh, elements that we gather information on but for wow. each element uh, it takes no more than a couple seconds and you could be okay. red green or if you have issues with staffing or with flow or for example, the elevators broke down last night or there was a water leak. You know, a lot of that gotcha. information gets um, uh, circled up um, here at the huddle. And then people who are accountable for each of those areas have to then give an update or status in terms of where they are with addressing that. Yeah. And then the following day, they have to say whether it was resolved or not. Some problems, you know, get resolved within hours yeah. and some within minutes. Some take a longer time. But regardless, we keep it there and we talk about it in a couple of days if it's still not resolved. Now, how long do you allocate for it? Is it? It's usually 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Do you do it standing? Yeah, well... <laughs> Half the people are standing. Yeah. People who come earlier grab seats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's usually no more than 15 or 20 minutes. The other part, Monty, is that we always end with recognitions. Yeah. Uh. And we always start with overnight safety events mm -hmm. uh. and good catches. So, you know, talking about the transformation that's needed to get to zero harm, we want to recognize people who actually um, identify problems uh, before they affect patients, yeah. right? Before the problem, in fact, um, hurts a patient. If mm -hmm. people identify a problem, you know, that's considered a good, good catch. And yeah. we actually give them a pin to recognize them. Um, so you actually award people for doing the right thing exactly. when normally you would probably feel intimidated in most organizations. Right. Yeah. And then at the end, um, you know, we always identify situations where people have gone above and beyond mm -hmm. and we recognize them openly. So yes. it's really started to this culture um, where things are transparent, where people um, feel like things are fair. Safe zone safe. too. <laughs> exactly. They feel comfortable. Yeah. Speaking up, um, being rec and just just the positive reinforcement has also helped create a really nice culture. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that that 15 to 20 minutes standing cuts out about 5,000 emails. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to tell you that um, it, definitely we don't get a lot of emails around these issues because they get solved uh, in real yeah. time. Wait for ten o'clock. Yeah. And just get it, get, get it all out. Get it done. <laughs> I, I definitely uh, feel uh, uh, it, it's great. It's it's really really helped the communication. One one more question on the huddling. Do the, the the huddling the huddles that take place on the rock face on the floor? Do you do them in public, 
or do you go to a private room? And he was asked. Oh, the that, ones on the floor. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it happens right in the unit. Yeah. So right patients. In the unit. Perfect. So usually, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, you have patients who may be walking by. If yeah. the patient actually happens to be walking um, in the corridor and and they, there's a huddle going on. Um, if they want to observe, they're welcome to observe. You, we, we usually don't take patients' names and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so uh, if we need to, we ensure nobody's around. You so know? I think that's a very positive Transparent, step as well. Yeah. yeah. I love this theme, though, um, That for everything that you've been talking about, is getting your, I mean, employees, your team involved from the bottom up, top down. Because so many of these initiatives, they come from the top, but they don't do anything with the people that are actually the ones that are having to communicate and having to you know, do the change themselves. And so, I mean, I think that's such an important part of, of transformational change and change management. Absolutely. That gets forgotten. Uh, absolutely. Like you said, you know, you got to make sure that the front lines are involved yeah. in the change. You hear from them. And, uh, you know, what's really, really uh, striking, exciting about the huddle is that uh, anybody who's there can speak up yeah. um, afterwards to recognize their peers. Um, and then we go down every item. So whoever is the lead for that area, you know, will speak up and tell us if there's any issues. And they usually say red or green mm. um, as a way to signal if things are good. Yeah. You you showed us, I got a, drew a graph out here. You it can, <laughs> it's not a great radio <laughs> shot, that one. But it's this extraordinary graph of the inverse relationship between surgical site infections and safety culture score. Yeah. So if you have a very high safety culture score in your organization, you have very few surgical site infections. Is that, is, did I get yeah, that right? That's right. That first uh, graph that I showed you was actually a paper, paper from 2016. Yeah. That was not from our hospital. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. That was um, seven other hospitals, and uh, that was a different publication. The second graph I showed was from our organization. Uh, but really, I think there's uh, more and more... Uh, uh, more and more evidence that it suggests um, that if you in fact uh, improve the culture of safety, uh, your outcomes improve. Yeah. Because I think it's all about the teamwork. Of course, um, you know, if you have great teamwork, um, then you actually can deliver great outcomes. You yeah. know. Oh, absolutely. And, and what's the safety culture score have in it? Can you remember some of the elements? Yeah. So uh, the culture of safety, uh, there are different surveys out there. Um, As you know, the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has a validated instrument. Um, There's another instrument that we've used in our operating uh, operating room called uh, Pascal Metrics. I believe that's uh, the name of the um, tool that's being used in the OR. And a lot of these tools have been validated. But the questions are, um, for example, um, you know, for the the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, for the AHRQ, um, they have questions such as, um, how do you perceive the leadership? Are they transparent about safety? How do you feel um, uh, the culture is? Is it punitive or yeah, not? You know? So uh, there's a lot of great questions. I can certainly give you more details of those questions, if you like. So, so one last thing I've written down, if that's all right, Desiree, is... Yeah, please. You were asked about your cancellation rates for surgery. <laughs> and you, <laughs> I love and that. You, you reported that it's quite high. Very high. If I can paraphrase what you said, the sooner you fall behind, the longer you have to catch up. <laughs> it was my old adage at school, in other words. <laughs> no, <laughs> our rates are, are, are uh, terrible, um, 7%. But I have to be honest with you. You know, we... Um, I, when I started the, the chief medical officer, we had so many other issues and problems that this went lower down on my list of priorities. Mm-hmm. But now that I've been there over two years, this is a deliverable this year. Great. But, but I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think you implied the fact that you don't have a pre-op clinic. We have a, a pre-operative clinic now with advanced practice providers, but I don't think they have the level of supervision and... Um, the expertise that they need, uh, the system is not where I'd like to 
um, uh, see it to be. You know, so what I le- what I've been telling our leaders is our preoperative clinic is called PRAC, uh, Preoperative mm. Risk Assessment Clinic, and I tell them we are now going to be moving towards PRAC 2.0, <laughs> uh, and that's the plan for this year. And I think that's going to hopefully help us. Uh, get the outcomes that we need, which is uh, hopefully a cancellation rate of uh, less than at least two uh, percent. Because the uh, in the we talked about this often on Top Med Talk in the yeah. NHS, we're about as mean as you can possibly get <laughs> with money. So we really, really, it's really un- unlikely we would do anything unless we were certain it was value for money. And as far as I know, we've got complete preoperative clinic coverage in the whole NHS and have done for, for, for a very long time. So it's kind of like yeah. slam dunk. Well, what's the disconnect there? Because you're not the yeah. first person we've heard. I think Lee Fleischer told us they don't have They don't have one, yeah. You know, the, the issues are uh, there are multiple stakeholders. Yeah. In the national health system, you don't have um, a lot of private physicians. I mean, you do have private mm-hmm. health care uh, in the UK, obviously, but in the United States, you know, you have uh, a lot of physicians um, who are private practitioners. And uh, historically, our healthcare system has really incentivized volume mm-hmm. over value, oh, yeah. as you know. Um, as a result of that, um, in a lot of these healthcare systems, the referring physicians or the primary care physicians want to do their own preoperative evaluation. Yeah. So it's tough to try to consolidate it, especially if you're a community hospital with a large number of private medical staff. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think we're nearing a point where um, we all want to do what's right for the patient. And what's right for the patient is making sure that they're appropriately optimized. And I feel like there's so much variation when multiple Mm -hmm. Uh, groups are doing it but if you can bring it together with standardized algorithms um, hopefully we can get the the appropriate outcomes thank you so much (laughs) thank you for having me Uh, Monty and Desiree it was a pleasure Top Med Talk Nick Majerison here thanks for listening to Top Med Talk now all you need to do is find us on social media we can be friends on Facebook we can follow each other on Twitter we can hang out on Instagram or we can even gawp at each other on YouTube get onto your social media platform whichever your favourite is and you're likely to find Top Med Talk there whilst you're at it make sure you've subscribed to this podcast so you never ever miss an episode helps us enormously if you do that by the way and check out the website topmedtalk.com on there you can find the email updates where we update you as to what we're doing each week and whilst you're online whilst you're doing your thing on the internet i highly recommend you download all of the podcasts that we've put out here on top med talk we do an enormous amount of material here a lot of it is incredibly valuable and of course uh, will be in the future so i just recommend you download the entire back catalog if you could helps us out if you do that as well and check out edpom.org forward slash meetings because if you go on there you can find out where we're recording and what we're doing because we go to the big meetings the EBPOM meetings you may have noticed most of our material comes from some of these wonderful conferences that are organized by evidence-based perioperative medicine so EBPOM E-B-P-O-M dot org forward slash meetings get yourself on there and why not check out the Dallas Masters course a perioperative care practicum hopefully I'll see you there